acknowledge that it's only by your grace that we stand. There's no works, no effort, nothing that we can do to earn your favor, to earn salvation. We come to you simply, purely, only on the basis of your grace. We thank you that you initiated that grace towards us. You've given us the creation, as we just sang about, which testifies of you. You've given us your word. And we thank you for those things, Lord. We thank you that we might know your law, see our sin, and call out to heaven for grace. And we receive it again today with grateful hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. We are in a series in the book of Daniel called Living in Babylon. And we are in week three of at least 18 weeks, maybe more. Uh, Daniel is, a, is a, an interesting book, but I promise you, you will not get bored in Daniel because it only gets more interesting as it goes along. And here in chapter two this morning, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has had a prophetic dream. We won't get to the content of the dream until next week if the Lord tarries. Um, but as I was thinking about dreams and such this week, I remembered some lines from William Shakespeare. I've been referencing old Bill Shakespeare a lot lately. I'm not sure why. But the phrase, what dreams may come. Anybody know which play? Hamlet. Oh, yeah, there's one, one person, you uncultured Philistines. Um, don't know your Shakespeare. You don't have it memorized? What? What's the matter with you? Here's the, here's the quote, part of the quote from Hamlet. You ready for this? You need a little culture this morning. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them, to die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache of a thousand natural shocks that the flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. And aye, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. Hamlet is wrestling with the decision about what to do how best to take revenge upon his uncle, who has not only murdered Hamlet's father, the king, but has concealed the matter, and now has married Hamlet's mother, the queen, who has no idea what's happened. And interestingly enough, Hamlet only comes by this knowledge via his dead father's ghost that keeps appearing to him. So the really funny thing I think about Shakespeare <clears throat> is that though many consider Shakespeare's works to be high art, elevated literature, you could actually take any Shakespearean play and set it in the backwoods of South Georgia among competing clans of rednecks and not have to change a thing. You've got family feuds, uh, incest, drunkenness, raucous parties. Yep, it's Shakespeare hillbillies. It, it just translates cross culture. It's crazy. But Hamlet's soliloquy is world famous. I actually had to memorize that in the 11th grade and recite it in a class. And no, I could not do that from memory at this point in my life. But the gist of what Hamlet is dealing with is uh, not only what to do with this revelation about his uncle, but what it all means. And ultimately, he's struggling with what happens when we die and whether or not life is really worth continuing to try to live. And so like Hamlet... Uh, in, our, in our section of Scripture, Daniel is receiving revelation as well. This idea of revelation is kind of thematic here um, because it's coming via supernatural means. And through his obedience and submission to God, he is used by God to give us some revelation as well. And so there's, uh, we've seen this story start, start with these youths who are taken into captivity and now we're seeing this uh, pattern emerge of Daniel's faithfulness and his friends. Uh, and it reminded me of a story I heard some years ago of some young men who loved Jesus who were just starting their freshman year of college. I was in campus ministry for 10 years at the University of Georgia. I've seen this kind of story play out. They all had the same class early Monday morning, their first class, and they quickly discovered that their professor was deeply anti-Christian and was determined to undermine the Bible. 
And in his very first lecture, their very first class, their freshman year of college, this professor stood up and said this, if you believe the myths of the Bible, I want you to stand up right now. And several, including these young men, stood up in the room. And he added this. He said, this semester, I'm going to free you from the constraints of religious Bible nonsense. I have read the Bible, and I assure you it is not inspired by God. It is the rantings of confused men. One of these young men had the presence of mind to speak up in that moment and say, Sir, the Bible is God's letter to Christians. If you are confused about it, it's because you're reading someone else's mail. He's right. Wisdom and insight come to Hamlet. Wisdom and insight come to Daniel. Wisdom and insight come to us in the same way, via two avenues. We have reason and revelation. We have reason and revelation. And as we read Daniel 2 this morning, you can readily make the same observation. If you want to understand a thing, you have to study a thing. That is the exercise of your reason. God's given us the ability to reason. And so we, we read about this in Romans 1, right? Romans 1, 18, 19, and 20. Paul says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, in order to suppress the truth, what do you have to have? You have to have the truth. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what can be known about God, Scripture says, is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Well, how has he done that? Well, Paul goes on. He says his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Right? This is reason through observation of the creation. And that reason can get us to the knowledge that God exists and can get us to the knowledge that, uh, of what some of his attributes are. But, but beyond that, when it comes to God, our reason is insufficient. It's insufficient to gain the full knowledge of everything that God wants us to know about him in this life right now. And, and so... Um, we have to enter into relationship with him in order to gain that knowledge. We need his revelation. And so here in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar is a man who's about to find out that he needs both of those things. He needs reason and he needs revelation. And we'll see this here in the text. If you have your Bible, Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. If you have your mobile device, the YouVersion Bible app, go to the main menu and click events and you'll see Emmaus Road Church and you can follow along in my notes. It says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded the magicians and enchanters and sorcerers and Chaldeans to be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in, and they stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. And the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and its interpretation. And they answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream, and, and we will show its interpretation. And the king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation." And the Chaldeans answered the king and said, There's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands. For no great and powerful king has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. 
Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. And Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise man of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? And Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested that the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So let's go back and let's just take this apart verse by verse. Look at verse 1 again. In the second year of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, he had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. So Daniel and his friends have been att attending Babylon University for three years. According to Babylon, Babylonian reckoning, a king did not count his first year as part of his reign, and I have no idea why. I looked all over this week. I could not find a good reason, but that's Babylonian reckoning. And so what you, you have here in the second year of the reign, and they completed three years of school. That's why the text looks funny. Um, we have the right time sequence here. Even though at a glance it looks like it's off, three years have transpired since chapter 1. And that may seem like a small detail to mention, but it's the kind of thing that fuels critics who want to say that the Bible's full of errors. And so I wanted to make sure we covered that. It said, Nebuchadnezzar has a troubled spirit. I mean, imagine that. Think about that. He's got all the money, women, power, status, stuff that the world could possibly offer, and he's troubled. That's kind of frustrating and a relief at the same time, right? Because we think if we could just get all that stuff, we had all those things, then our life would be free of trouble, but it's not. Uh, in fact, Nebuchadnezzar's in really good company. You read Genesis 41, you find that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was troubled by his dreams. In, in Psalm 77, verse 4, Asaph, who was the king of Israel, was troubled and he couldn't sleep. In Judges 13, it says Samson was troubled by the Philistines and their attacks against the people of God. And Scripture's just packed with people who, who uh, are troubled in heart. And I hope that that's an encouragement to you. Uh, because when you're troubled, you know that you're in good company. But at the same time, I, I would want that to be a rebuke to you if you wrongly think that you're the only one whose heart has been troubled. And that's, that's a trap we fall into, isn't it? We get in that dark place and we think we're the only one who's ever experienced this. And Scripture says, no, your experience is really common, actually. It's God stretching your soul, reminding you of your desperation for him. In fact, Jesus said in John 16, uh, I've said these things to you so that in me you may have peace. Not in the world, not in your stuff, not even in other people, but in Jesus. He says, in this world you will have Tribulation, some translations say trouble. You will have trouble, but take heart. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. You see, we're made for God. We're made for God, and he will trouble us until we seek for him. He will do that. He will agitate you. He'll put a pebble in your shoe. You ever been on a hike and just get just a tiny little rock in your shoe? What do you have to do? Do you just keep hiking for miles and miles with a little pebble? You got you to gotta pull over, take the shoe off, Get the rock out so that you can go on hiking. It's just so irritating, right? And God will do that. He will do that. He will irritate us until we seek him and deal with the thing that he wants us to deal with. Look at verse 2. The king commanded that the magicians and enchanters, sorcerers, and Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. So here's the deal. Like if the king can't sleep and he calls you in at 2 a.m., you get up and you do what the king says. Okay? It's good to be the king. So... Some of you in the, my generation got that reference. Don't, don't share it with anybody else. It's just between us. So, so Nebi have a, has a bad dream. He can't go back to sleep, but that's not all that we're dealing with. This is a vivid, prophetic vision, dream, given by God to King Nebuchadnezzar to show him, we'll find out next week, the, the future history of all the world empires in succession. It, it was overwhelming to him. He couldn't even understand it or, or remember it. 
and it made quite an impression. And so the king says, verse 3, I had this dream. My spirit's troubled to know the dream. I, I want to understand it. And the Chaldean said, well, great. Oh, king, live forever. You, you're the greatest. Tell us the dream. Just tell us what it was, and we'll give you the interpretation. And the king said, whoa, wait. The word for me is firm. You've got to make known to me both the dream and the interpretation. Or, or I'll tear you limb from limb, and your houses will be laid in ruins. So show me the dream and the interpretation, and if you can do that, I'll give you gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation. And it may be, it may be that the king had forgotten the dream but was still emotionally disturbed by the dream. The wording's a little vague here in the text, but it's more likely that he's testing this core of wise men. He's testing them. Now, they're the kind of people that will tell you what they think you want to hear. And he... he He's not putting up with that. He hadn't been the king for very long, but Nebuchadnezzar has the wisdom to know that most, not all, but most politicians will tell you what you want to hear if it means they can stay in power. And so he's taking that ploy away from them. He's raising the stakes, and he sets a timer. Now they're under pressure. And you hear the Jeopardy theme song starting to play in the background. And, and at this point, the dangling of carrots and promises of wealth and honor don't really matter. It's like... They're just desperate to keep their lives because they know that they cannot do what the king has asked them to do. And so they answered a second time, verse 7. Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. And the king said, I know with certainty you're trying to gain time. You're just stalling, is what he's saying. Because you see that the word is firm from me. If you don't make known the dream to me, there is but one sentence for you. You've agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me until I change the times. In other words, until I give you more time, you keep stalling. Therefore, tell me the dream, and then I will know that you can show me its interpretation. And the Chaldeans answered the king, there's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or Chaldean. They said, this is unprecedented. This thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So they're, they're attempting to buy time, and the king keeps putting it down, and he asks something altogether unreasonable. It's unreasonable to ask this for these wise guys, but it's not impossible for God. He's just asking the wrong people. The king Nebuchadnezzar has this vague notion that he needs something more profound than what the Chaldeans can offer him, what they can provide. And whether you know it or not, we have the same problem. You see, we don't realize it until we've tasted and seen that the world's answers are empty and vacuous. And then when we've tasted the world for a little while and we realize that it's empty and it can't provide what we really need, that's when we begin to turn to God. And so we readily turn to philosophy and worldly solutions and anything that we can grab onto only to find them empty and, and wanting. And it's God himself that we're actually seeking. Man, would that just... Half the people in the streets in these days would realize that reality. Look at verse 12. Because of this, the king was angry. He was very furious. He commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. And Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guards, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? And Arioch made known the matter to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. He just goes in, he says, King, what do you think is a reasonable amount of time to give me? I will bring you the interpretation, the dream and the interpretation. Will you give me some time to do that? So Daniel answers politely, tactfully, and discretion is something that too few have in our day. Um, this is an important side here, but Proverbs 26, 16, the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men that can answer sensibly. And we, we, we just, we're quick to say what we think, not quick to, to take the time to figure out if what we think is right. We're not slow to speak, slow to get angry. We're quick to those things. I think about Abigail, the wife of Nabal. Do you remember the story from, from the life of David? David's running from Saul, and at one point he goes and asks, some of his guys ask this, this guy Nabal for food and for help and resources, and he says, who's David? I don't even, like, that guy's trash. I'm not helping you guys. 
and he, and he goes beyond that, and he shaves off their beards and their hair, which is a disgrace, right, and sends them back to David. And David mounts up, man. He's like, let's go. We're going to kill this guy. And he's on his way to kill Nabal and all of his men and everything that he owns. They're going to put to death all his livestock. And Abigail gets wind of this, and she comes out and meets David on the road and pleads with him. She reasons with him. She says, why would my king do such a thing? You will put you have blood on your hands, and you will sin before the Lord. And David, this is what David says to her. He says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion. Blessed be you, you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and working salvation by my own hand. David recognizes God's intervention through Abigail. This is composure, discretion. You see that in Daniel. He replies with prudence and discretion. These magi have begged for more time along with the tacit acknowledgement. Did you catch this in the text? He said, only the gods can give you that information, which is an admission that they can't, that they don't have access to the gods. They don't have access. It's crazy that they would admit that. But Daniel's not pleading for more time. He's sending the king a very sure word that there will come an answer. It is coming. They just need a short time to pray. That's a huge difference. And it made me think of my favorite Christian band of all time this week. You'll never guess who it is. You probably have never heard of them if you're under 30. Who, who, who said it? Petra. Yes. Yes. Petra had an album in 1982. Some of you weren't born. Shame on you. 1982 called More Power to You. Let me just read you some. See, this is what you get to do when you're the pastor. You get to read old song lyrics because you're the pastor. And you just have to sit there and take it. So listen to this. More power to you. Title track off the 1982 album by the same name. It says, you've been fe- you say you've been feeling weaker, weaker by the day. You say you can't make the joy of your salvation stay. But good things come to them that wait, not to those who hesitate. So hurry up and wait upon the Lord. More power to you when you're standing on his word. When you're trusting with your whole heart in the message you have heard. More power to you. When we're all in one accord, those that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew, they shall renew their strength. I love that line. Hurry up and wait upon the Lord. Hurry up and wait upon the Lord. That's exactly what Daniel's doing. I just can't wait to get to heaven and hang out with Daniel and Petra. That's going to be awesome. It's going to be a party. I can't wait. So good. And then verse 17, Daniel went to his house. And he made known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So notice here at the end of this section, the king has summoned all the wise men and Chaldeans. And if, if you're savvy, you're asking yourself the question, why would he do that when at the end of chapter 1, it says that the king recognized that they were ten times better than all the other wise men and magi. Why would he do that? I think, one, he's panicked. He's panic-stricken. This dream was so vivid, so alarming, that uh, he's desperate for answers. But I think more than that, here's my theory, and I think it has merit because this is what Scripture teaches. I believe that God is more glorified and magnified through Daniel once all of Satan's best efforts and man's best ploys and devices have failed. It's going to let them just do their best and then fail and then step in in the power of the Spirit and say, here's what you've asked for because it gives glory to God, right? And so God is letting this play out. The result is going to be, and you'll see in the coming chapters, the drawing of King Nebuchadnezzar's heart towards God. But I want to circle back to this notion of reason versus revelation. There are schools of thought in Western civilization that put all of their hope into reason. So reason is the only thing we have. It's the only thing we need. And then there are entire religions and systems that shun reason in favor of revelation from some supernatural source, whatever it is. What I want to say to you this morning is that biblical Christianity harmonizes both of those, reason and revelation. God has made us thinking creatures. We are able to reason. But as we read earlier in Romans 1, our reason can only get us so far. 
especially in the knowledge of God. And and my observation of culture, especially the last 40 years, has been that we have realized that the reason only gets us so far at an existential level, and, and largely the culture has then turned away from reason to revelation at the expense of reason. When I say the culture's turned to revelation, I don't mean the Word of God. I mean any other form of revelation. So so we we hit the wall with reason, like that can't get us where we want to go, and so now we're going to turn to to other sources of knowledge, right? So so let me me define revelation for you, because I'm not talking about the last book of the Bible. I'm talking about the concept, which is this, supernatural disclosure of truth that we could not otherwise know. It is supernatural disclosure of truth that we could not otherwise know. Namely, this entails who God is and what he's like beyond what we can reasonably deduce from creation. We talk about the revelation of God. Now, there are other sources, other entities, and we know that they're demonic, that are, that are playing at this game to say, I'll give you revelation about this thing. Uh, that revelation um, is not what we're talking about generally. But the revelation revealing to us is most fully manifesting God's word and his son the revelation of God, both of which have been given to us if we will receive them. But despite these good and perfect gifts that God has offered to humanity come down from the Father of lights, we're still prone to run after counterfeits. We seem to want to go after the false stuff. And I just want to say to you this morning, don't be deceived by what is false. There are false revelations out there, false uh, sources of information from the supernatural realm that will lead us astray. There horoscopes, occult, Ouija boards, divining, the Enneagram, necromancy, false revelations, all meant to deceive. Their source is what's false. But I'll I'll just tell you this, what's deceptive about them is sometimes the revelation, sometimes what's told to you can be true. That's why it's deceptive. Because Satan and his demons can be right about some things. Especially when we give ourselves over to be manipulated by them. We start seeking information from those sources. Now we're easily manipulated. Now they can say to you, oh, this week you'll meet this person and they will be the love of your life. And then they're working to bring that person into your life. They they can manipulate circumstances, right? It's deceptive. Don't use pragmatism as your excuse and go, yeah, but it works. Don't don't do that. God has forbidden our involvement in uh, other sources of revelation besides him. And that should be the end of the discussion. But even as born-again Christians, followers of Jesus, we have a tendency to turn to other sources of revelation. It's just our sin it leads us there. We're not content with what God has said. So that's one hurdle, right? But beyond that hurdle, there's this reality that some people read the Bible and they say, well, I want God's revelation. I, I want to understand it. And then they read it and they can't. They can't understand it. I was thinking about this this week. I remember being 14 years old and having a... a conversation with my parents and then a conversation with a pastor in the church we were attending I said, I really want to understand the Bible. I was trying to read the Bible at 14 and I could not understand it. It was so frustrating. I would read the Bible and I I just couldn't understand what it was saying and I wanted to know it and I went to church every Sunday but when I read the Word of God it didn't make sense to me. But the Bible itself answers this question for us in 1 Corinthians 2. Paul says in verse 10, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit teaches, excuse me, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Or who knows what a person's thoughts are except the Spirit of that person that's in them. In the same way, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. That we might understand the things freely given to us by God. So we've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit of God, so that we can understand. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. In other words, you have to be born again, and the Holy Spirit has to come and live inside of you for you to be able to understand God's Word. Now, people can read it all day long and say, there's some great truths here and some great principles for living, but they're not really going to understand God's Word apart from being born again. This is the natural person, Paul says in verse 14, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. They have to be discerned by the Holy Spirit in us. 
So we submit ourselves to God's authority. We come under his reign and his rule and his lordship, and we're made new. And that regeneration and the impartation of the Holy Spirit as salvation opens up the way for us to interact with God and his word and understanding and gaining wisdom from it. And now, because we, we want to obey, that's the access point. Right? Suddenly we want to do what God tells us to do, and that's where we begin to gain knowledge and wisdom from God. See, the, the knowledge and understanding comes with obedience, not simply the assent to some right information. You're thinking, I can just open the Bible. I don't care a lick about following Jesus or obeying Jesus or obeying his word. I just want to know what it says. You're not going to understand it. You're not going to get there because it only comes by obedience. And ultimately, this is the core difference between Daniel and his friends and the other magi and Chaldeans because those men wanted knowledge that they could use to manipulate and gain power. Daniel is seeking the Lord God Almighty as a first priority, not for the sake of knowledge, but, but wants to obey him and be faithful to him, and he's receiving wisdom from God as a result that he might do good and influence other people. God knows the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. He wants us to seek for him. He wants us to come after him, but he also wants us to do it with right motives. Right? So take that thought, reason and revelation. And then I want to make a particular point of application because our current situation is one of living in Babylon. That's a series title and it's, I believe, the reality of where we live today. And there are false gospels, false claims of supernatural revelation, false claims to be the way of salvation, infiltrating the church at an unprecedented rate. I want to give you my number one false gospel this morning. I think is social gospel. It's social justice. I think it's the number one false gospel in the United States, at least, probably in the whole world. We, we, this is also known by intersectionality, critical race theory, social justice. All of those are forms of neo-Marxism. It's repackaged communism. Don't take my word for it. I, I say this every week. Do not take my word for these things. Go, go and study to show yourself a workman approved who rightly divides the word of truth. Go and read at length about these topics, right? Go and be Berean. Test it. Test what I'm telling you. Now stay with me, because this is about our reason and the revelation of God in the context of our moment in history. I want to explain to you why the social gospel is so dangerous. The reality of the religion of intersectionality is that you can't have any religious system piecemeal, because religious systems by nature of what they are, touch and affect every aspect of a person's life when they adopt them. They permeate their thinking. They permeate their actions, permeate their interactions. So they shape our thoughts, our feelings, our actions. They form a worldview, a cohesive worldview, how we see the world. And that worldview of intersectionality or what we call critical race theory or social justice is not compatible with biblical Christianity. It is neo-Marxism through and through. It endorses and encourages a victim mentality that drives people away from the gospel because the individual is no longer personally responsible for the things in his or her life, but increasingly is blaming others for their, all their woes. And so sin's no longer personal. Sin's no longer in me. It's not an in me problem. It's an out there in the system problem. It's, it's only something that's done to me, not something that I do. Sin is redefined, right? And, and so, um, therefore, I have nothing to repent of in my estimation because I'm a victim, and I, I'm a victim of my circumstances. I'm a victim of other people and systemic problems in society. And so our enemy, Satan, has successfully mixed up reason and revelation and churned out uh, this, this idea, and the culture's thinking is upside down and backwards on this. And in our desperation to reconcile the wisdom of this world with the wisdom of God, we have forgotten that even the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. Now, do we have a problem? Is racism real? Is it a problem? Is it a sin? Yes. Is social justice the answer? No. You see, the gospel says, confess your sins against the holy God. Repent and turn away from those sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. The false gospel of social justice says, confess your racism and your inherent moral superiority against minorities. 
Repent and join the right movements and say the right things as you signal your newfound virtue. Believe in critical race theory, intersectionality, and neo-Marxism, and you will be woke. That's the promise. So now the culture can just redefine sin. You see how this works? See, the culture can just redefine sin to be whatever the latest offense has become. And you and I should just expect this, that we will grovel in abject humility before the gods of culture. We will never know what new violation we might unintentionally commit that would result in the loss of our salvation in that new system. It's constant, changing. Critical race theory, intersectionality, social justice is the new Gnosticism. You know what that's? A, the Gnosticism is ancient Greek religious system. It's called hidden knowledge. Some people only have a hidden knowledge of what the, the supernatural is truly like, and it's only accessible through certain means, and everybody else doesn't have access to that, so they don't know, right? You don't know what you don't know. And so uh, that's Gnosticism. Anyone who embraces this view could say to you, well, I have a knowledge that you can't acquire because you're blank. Fill in the blank. You're white or you're male or you're privileged, or you're part of the hegemony. You you can't reason with that. You can't reason with that. It's not a falsifiable statement. You can't refute the secret knowledge that only they have. And it doesn't matter if you try to reason with it because it's ultimately about another person's experience. So reason goes out the window. Logic has no bearing. And truth is now relative to the individual experience. Revelations become completely subjective. And the Bible is being reinterpreted to fit this new worldview. I just say to you this morning, rather than bow the knee to Baal or Molech or the gods of this age, we will preach the true gospel without fear and hesitation. It's what the world needs now more than ever in this moment. We need the gospel, the true gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God that made a way for us to be saved. It's the only hope for humanity. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God into salvation for everyone who believes. And what's being propagated today as social gospel is not the gospel. It's not the gospel. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded. That means think clearly. When you go out into the world, have your, your grid up, your filter, where you discern and think clearly, and be watchful. He says, be watchful because your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion. He's seeking someone to devour. Men and women, it is reason and revelation. It's not one or the other. Our secularist culture sees them as opposed to one another. The church sees them both as necessary for a relationship with God. Daniel believed that God would give both the content and the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And believing that, Daniel didn't suspend his use of reason. Rather, he used it to understand God's revelation to him and to formulate a response. And as the story moves forward in the text, we're going to see that the king has strong reasons now to take Daniel seriously. This claim that Daniel makes that the God of heaven has both given him the dream and its interpretation. You know, it's interesting to me, in reading uh, in 2 Peter this week, uh, Peter makes the same claim about God's revelation. In 2 Peter 1, he says this. Peter says, We didn't follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Let me just stop. You ever been at a party and you got a group of people telling party stories? You know what I'm talking about? Party stories? Everybody's got a better party story. You've got to one-up each other. Oh, yeah, well, that's a great story. But let me tell you what happened to me, right? And everybody's trying to one-up each other the party story. Peter's got the ultimate party story. It's a, it's a party killer. Okay, let me tell you what. Here's Peter's story. Like, nobody can top this. Peter says, when we re- when we, For when we received honor and glory from God the Father... The voice was born to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. And we ourselves heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have a more prophetic word, more fully confirmed. I'll just stop right there. Peter's saying, hey, that Mount of Transfiguration thing, Jesus was glorified, Moses and Elijah were there. Peter doesn't mention the fact that he stepped all over himself going, We'll build tabernacles. And God had to say, This is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him, right? 
he leaves that part out of the party story. But, but this is the story. We were on the Mount of Transfiguration. We saw Jesus glorified, and then, he, and then he says this, and we have a prophetic word that's more fully confirmed. We have a more sure word to which you would do well to pay attention like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture ever came about by somebody's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter's saying, look, we had the ultimate experience with God. We were on the mountain. Jesus was glorified. Moses was there glorified. Elijah was there glorified. And we got to see it, but this is more authoritative. You tracking with that? This is more authoritative. And right now, at this very hour in history, we need more than ever to be carried along by the Holy Spirit. Not in receiving new revelation because God's word is complete, but in being empowered to boldly carry the gospel to the lost in this hour. Not carried along by the spirit of this age because that's a deceiving spirit that twists the revelation of God and corrupts man's ability to reason and think clearly. We need to fearlessly proclaim the gospel of Jesus whereby men and women are judged individually for the sins that they commit by a holy God. And the only way to escape the coming judgment is not by virtue signaling or capitulating to the culture, but putting your faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's the gospel. That's salvation. We need Daniels. We need men and women like Daniel to rise up in this hour. It's a late hour in our American Babylon. We need men and women in the church to rise up and courageously say the truth of God's revelation to our culture, to preach the gospel so that some might be saved. You don't have to be appointed, appointed an advisor to, to the president to do that. You, you can do that right where you are. In whatever context God has put you, you can do that right where you are. God has appointed you for this moment in history. You know that Acts says that. He's appointed the places and the times. God didn't appoint you for 5th century feudal China. He put you right here at the beginning of the 21st century in America at the moment when everything's crumbling all around us. And he's given you the gospel of Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with it? You can embrace the words of Mordecai to Queen Esther in the book of Esther when he reminds her and God has put you here precisely in the situation that you're in for such a time as this. I believe that, folks. It's the only thing that gives me peace in these days, knowing that God has put us here for such a time as this. And he is faithful, and he will pour out his Holy Spirit on us if we ask. He says, who, who would, if, you ask, if your kid asks you for, for uh, food, for fish, which of you would hand him a live snake? <laughs> None of you. Really? Good. That's good. I'm glad. He says, which of you, your kid wanted a loaf of bread, would hand him a rock? He says, okay, so if you, being evil parents, evil in heart, corrupt, wicked, sinful people, know how to give good gifts to your children and meet their needs, how much more will the Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? We need to ask for the Holy Spirit. We need to ask the Lord to pour out his spirit on his church. This is true for every one of us who names the name of Jesus. We've been appointed for this hour, and we need the Holy Spirit. 